Yeah. Okay. All right. So thanks for organizing this. These are called. At some point, these will be announced. I think on the web page. At least I've been I've been told that these are special lectures on Brown Lewin and Nelson Thomas theory. The reason they are special lectures is why I do not necessarily just go to the very scratch like a defining things at a very basic level. It could be a good thing, but that takes a much longer while. These are probably eight lectures for now, but I, I'm assuming that maybe it will be ten lectures. Goal is to kind of tell you a story about interaction between these two different theories and Marge Bagley properties. I mean, there are several things in ground within or down sometimes theories which people are interested in. Some of them are motivated by string theory. One of them is the modularity property of the generating series of invariants that we calculate. The other one is integrality, for example. My goal mainly is to prove modularity in different contexts. And you can see a lot of geometries in there and some of the things that we know from the past, like t-duality and so on, they come in, wall crossings come in, things like that. This is based on the mainly you know, on the papers that we, I wrote together with my collaborators in the past seven years. Um, so, based on joint work with um, uh, one of four and um, Richard Thomas, Here also the Alpanescu. I will talk about all the joint work papers with them, the Alpanescu and company. So we were some five people on that paper. Um, also Bukov, Liu, and Yao, which was a recent thing. I mean, all of these works that we did, kind of one way or another, we were interested in this modularity problem. So I will first focus on some of the earlier works I did with Amin. And let me set up the geometry and you will see. So let's discuss moduli space, moduli space of two-dimensional sheets. And I would like to rigorously define what these are. So here's my geometry. Let x be a non-singular. This is a non-singular projective threefold over complex numbers with a fixed polarization. With a fixed polarization L. Now for a non-zero effective divisor class, let's call that F, where F is a divisor, we, we fix a churn character, we fix a churn character vector. So I will be calling this from now on churn star. Define it as zero r times f gamma and some churn three. This is obviously an element of even cohomology of our uh, our threefold with rational coefficients. It goes from h zero to h six. Zero churn character, which is a rank, per churn character, which is the co dimension one cohomology information of the sheet. Second churn character is the kind of curve classes, if there are any. Uh, co dimension two, basically, co dimension three gives a number of points, oil characteristic, for example. 
Okay, so with R, so the condition is that with R bigger than zero. Now, F, if F is a constant uh, if F is a coherent sheet, F is a coherent sheet, coherent sheet with constant, I don't know why it's a constant, with churn of F equal to churn of star, then what that means is that then F is supported supported on um, of some divisor uh, with numerical class R prime times this element of Picard. So this is effective divisor class with where R prime dividing R. So for example, if you have something of churn character four times class of a hyperplane section of the three ball, it could be a sheaf of rank two on two times that class on a surface of degree two. Or it could be a rank one sheaf on four times that class, right? So it could be, it could have different possibilities. But this thing could be supported on something that you know, with the class R prime times F, as long as R prime divides R. We always assume that um, Giesecker L semi stable. With turn of f equal to shadow of star it is a stable. So semi stability for us will be always the stability. When is this satisfied? For example, um, depends. Depends. Like you can calculate slope of the function over its support, for example. You know, you can look at, um, so for this function over its support, you can take the uh, first chain character times some hyperplane class over its support, yeah. divided by its rank over its support, and the, oh, well, that's the slope. And if these two numbers are co-prime, for example, that's one condition. It's exactly like a uh, stability condition for the threefold. Right? Yeah. If your sheaf is rank one, for example, over its support, that's one condition. These are just ideal sheaves. They're going to be stable anyway. So you said the co condition? Yeah. Um, in the talk I gave before about nested Hilbertism, remember, I defined some notion of stability. I had a surface. And I had a sheaf which was supported on that surface also. And I defined a notion of the stability condition, which was churn character of the sheaf over its own support. So we had a sheaf on the threefold, but we were support, I'm pushing it forward onto surface. Then we were looking at its first churn character. That was some curve class. And we had some hyperplane class on that surface. You look at the product of those two divided by the rank of the sheaf. That was the stability condition that we defined. And then we make a, a thing that if it creates a common divisor, basically, if the two numbers are co-prime, then that sheep will be stable rather than same. Same similar situation here. Um, so let's now consider an L X and C H star. We want, I want to define it as moduli space, moduli space of E secure as a stable sheets with 
Chair equal to Chair star. So that's what I would like to define. I will discuss uh, semi-stability, actually. This is one of the lectures I missed. I mean, that's why I'm assuming that at least our lectures would be nine instead of eight. Because in the work with Yohaneski and company, we actually did study strictly semi-stable things. And we did some little kind of trick to study their kind of invariance and so on. But we will get there. So we have this. So in this level, I haven't said anything about particular the structure of the R3 poles. It just, it just, just modulates this. You can always define by, by our assumption. Assumption M is projective. Geometric points of M, geometric points um, correspond to Respond to isomorphism classes. I mean, these are to be analogies, but anyway, because this is, of course, isomorphism classes of the stable, stable sheaves with churn character, churn star. Okay. So there's this projective module, I think. And now we can define the notion of invariance and so on. So it is proven from Mark. It is proven by Hoybrex and Thomas. They have some beautiful paper which has deformation of structure theories, ATIA class, and things like that. In the, in the title, by Horvath and Thomas, it is proven that if the third relative extension of f trace three part of it is equal to zero for every point um, f inside our moduli space, then M admits a perfect deformation of structure theory. This is this is kind of very important actually. This is a little bit weaker than what you would expect. You could have X three and the trace three part you want to vanish. And I have not talked about, um, for example, did I say anything? No, I haven't talked about x being a Calabial 3, right? That's why this is kind of a very interesting thing, actually. So we don't have said right yet. If you have this condition, Still, your module this has a perfect definition of structures. It's interesting. Okay. So, can you still define DT just using this? Yeah, design? that's right. And you can. And so, let me just say how it is. In this case, Thomas. Um, constructs perfect um, deformation obstruction theory um, E dot, which is really meant to, together with a map to truncated cotangent complex of the modular space, such that. I cohomology of the drive dual of E dot is isomorphic to X I plus 1, F and F, 
for i equal to 0 and 1. And the reason you can define a dt invariant for this is because this way one obtains um, a virtual fundamental class virtual fundamental class and virtual um, which really is induced by the choice of obstruction theory. So if you change the obstruction theory, the virtual class changes. So really this is m comma e dot. That, that is trying to emphasize the dependence of the virtual class on the obstruction theory from now on. And this is some element of child homology of, well, of the moduli space which, which sits in the virtual dimension in the degree equal to virtual dimension of m. Well, you know, if you don't have serialty, for example, if you don't have self-symmetry of the subtraction theory, this could be some higher dimensional class. It sits in a positive degree. Then how can you define DT invariance? Then you need to integrate appropriate homology classes against it. And we saw this thing in, in the talk I gave about Nesta Hilbert. You know, those are the Downs and Thomas type invariants they were calculating. Okay, so this is that. Now, when virtual dimension of M is equal to zero, then things become nice because then dt of x moduli space of invariance on dt invariance of the moduli space M with, of, of sheets with churn character equal to churn start becomes equal to degree of the zero dimensional virtual class, which is an integer. Now, examples. So, one obvious example, I'm trying to cook up situations where the virtual dimension does become zero. One is the obvious one. So, one when x is a collabial three. Then, obstruction theory is symmetric. Then virtual dimension is zero, and we get what we want. And in fact, in here, by balance result, it's, it's worth pointing out, um, dt of x with churn star is the weighted Euler characteristic of the moduli space, where this function m is the Behrens um, constructible function defined on m. The constructible function of Behrens defines a kind of detects the singularity or the kind of singularity, order of singularity to moduli space at points. For example, if your moduli space is virtually a bunch of points, which means that this cycle sits in A0, then it could be a bunch of points, right? But that, I mean, these are not topological points. I mean, these could be points together with multiplicity. And barren function, if this is a point of multiplicity 2, this is a point of multiplicity 1, barren function detects what a characteristic to be 3. Whereas the usual what a characteristic doesn't do that. The usual what a characteristic just detects calculates as equal to 2. And the reason 
weighting the order characteristic by the Baron function is giving you um, the deformation invariant is really because of this fact. I mean, if you homogenize this really is like a bunch of points, if these points are deformable to one another, they come together and they give you a point of loss 52, for example. Baron function calculates this order characteristic equal to 2 and that order characteristic equal to 2. But the topological order characteristic calculates this as 2, calculates this as 1. So it's not deformation invariant. So that's why. Weighting the Euler characteristic by the Baron function, which keeps track of the order of singularity of the modular space at those virtually points that represent it, gives you a way of calculating a deformation invariant for, for the modular space. If the modular space is a smooth and so on, then multiplicities don't matter. Yeah, and so we can calculate also the Euler characteristic of the it is not only deformation variant, I mean, it will be also applied for the Okay. So this is the first example of when the virtual dimension becomes equal to zero. And now the second example is the following. When non-singular Projective threefold x admits um, surjection, surjective morphism surjective morphism like that with irreducible fibers onto a non-singular projective genus G curve, let's call it C, such that the following conditions are satisfied. First of all, Canonical of X is pulled back from the base for some line bundle on the curve. Secondly, that F is the class of the fiber, irreducible class, you see, is the class of the fiber because. You want irreducibility because it messes, reducibility messes with the stability. You want irreducible fibers. And part C, any Giesecker L semi stable sheaf, still we, have, we need that condition, the co primality co primality of the, uh, the train character. Chief F is a stable. What is F again? Ah, good. Sorry, because here, this I meant I have used F twice. Fs are sheaves also. <laughs> this was originally the class of the effective divisor class that I pick inside my variety. And the reason that this happens is also zero duality, really. I mean, if you look at x i, f comma f, eventually this is the same as x n minus i, f, f tensor with canonical of x, dual. And if I take the class of the support of f from the fiber, and I tell you that the canonical of x comes from the base, then this thing is isomorphic to f. So their dimensions match. So you don't need clavial condition. Yet you have symmetry. And the virtual dimension becomes equal to zero. 
this is the dimension of x1 minus x2. And the stability guarantees that, that x0, the stability together with shared duality guarantees that x0, the trace 3 part of it, okay, so x3 is really home, ffk, but ffk is f, f, f is a stable disk condition, it's c, trace 3 is 0, so x3, trace 3 of x3 is 0. So that's why we get all of that. So these are the two examples where the model by this kind of behaves as a bunch of points virtually. Now, for position, one, let um, i from x to c, we would, we would like to focus on this particular example in, in this analysis. I start, the way I'm cooking them, and if you eventually see the list of these vectors, I don't know where they appear, actually. They haven't yet appeared, I think. Eventually, when you see it, you will see that we will do a couple of lectures on K3 vibrations, actually. I mean, surface vibrations, these are surface vibrations. Um, the first two lectures on the smooth surface vibrations, then I move to Singular surface vibrations, nodal ones. Find how many of the fibers are nodal. Yeah, can you give an example of this? This? Yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, you can pick Lepsius pencil of cortex, for example. Let's say I need to cook it up. So if I have P3 times P1, Then I can pick a divisor in here of type um, 4, 2. And so the fibers are cortex in P3, so they're K3s. And this is some O2 inside. Here it's fibered over the base, so it's a surface fiber. And gets mapped naturally. It might be singular, but you can smooth it. It might be, it, it actually has no singularities, but you can smooth it. I mean, but in, in here, I haven't yet mentioned, yeah, I have mentioned not singular, okay, yeah, so you can smoothen it, yeah. But later, you don't need to smoothen it either. I mean, at least for sheets of dimension two, you know, support this complex two-dimensional, we don't need, um, I mean, we need to smoothen things eventually, but I mean, for sheets of dimension one, things which are look like, uh, they look like stable pair invariants and things like that, the situation becomes much harder, which is our work with Yokinobu Toda. But I will explain that later. But anyways, in, in both of these analyses that I'm going to put in here, there is some smoothening going on. You will see. Let's for now assume that I have a non-singular smooth vibration. Okay, and uh, so let pi x to c be, as an example two, with conditions a, b, c satisfied, then for every Geometric point um, F inside M, the support of that. So conditions A, B, C also tell us about what's the support, right? And the stability conditions, so all of these are taken into account. So F and F, the support of F. Um, is reduced and connect what's the proof the proof 
is that the support of S is connected since F is a stable. Otherwise, you can easily cook up the stabilizing machine. Since F is a stable, you just break the surface and to see the support is reduced, the support of F, to see the support of F is reduced, denote by S the support of F. This is very important with reduced structure. Suppose you want to say, suppose it's not reduced, let's call the reduced part of it S, and I show you that the support of F is S. So to reduce the structure, then Then what happens? And let I, the ideal sheaf of this reduced surface inside a threefold, ideal sheaf of S inside S. Of course, it's a divisor. Um, we have that Turn character of I restricted to S is equal to 1 is an ideal sheet of that surface, the restricted surface. <laughs> so since F is supported on S, on S, we, we see that Tensor I both have the same Hilbert polynomial now we can do a nice game now consider the canonical short exact sequence defining the surface inside our ambient variety X. That's the canonical short exact sequence. And we can tensor this thing with F. Of course, tensoring is right exact, but not, not left exact. So, so what do we get? We get F restricted to S this way. So after that, we get F restricted to S, we get F, and we get F tensor I. Now here is what happens. This guy is a stable. This guy, I just, it's a rank one thing. This guy is a stable. This guy is a stable. Actually, every polynomial of F tensor I is equal to the Hamilton polynomial of F. Now you have a morphism between two stable sheets with the same Hilbert polynomial. What happens? Either this map is an isomorphism, or it is inject, uh, zero. If this map is isomorphism, so if G is an iso, then that means that this map is equal to zero. Okay, the image of this map is zero. Zero goes to zero. Then F restricted to S is zero. And that cannot be. That is non trivial sheep on S. So it cannot be. So then that means that this map is zero. Then G is a zero map. Which means that the map from F to F restricted to its reduced support is an ISO. Yes. Then this is an ISO. 
isomorphism, which really means that f is support of f is to be its reduced support. So, so then support of f is reduced and is equal to s. So that's a little nice lemma. Of course, this is important because we would like to analyze the modular space of such things which are supported by the fibers. We want to know um, Okay. So we have this condition. Um, now, Proposition, as I said in the final of this uh, seven course, I have written, it's not appeared, but you will see, this kind of, I'm intentionally trying to keep the pace very slow. So it's like theorem proof stuff. Okay, so. We are not in rush or anything. I, I try to probably people completely understand what I'm talking about, and maybe later, actually, you help me to solve some of my questions. Okay. So proposition two, M admits um, perfect deformation obstruction theory with a virtual equal to zero. So by lemma that I just proved by lemma one and condition B in example two for any F inside the moduli space we have that um, this is what I proved before, right? We have that x3 of f comma f is the same as um, f f x or k of x, which is the same as um, f f and by similarity to c. So x3 f trace b is vanishing, and then virtual dimension of M also, and virtual dimension of M also is equal to zero. I, I really needed to say this thing after proof of this lemma, because we didn't know about the support of that. But okay, and then Now, I would like to define a notation. Let us define a map x times m to m as the map p, and also a map from m to the base curve as rho and x gets mapped to the base curve by the natural subjective morphism. And this map rho, rho basically sends on f to the pi of the support of f. But now we know that the support of f is the reduced fiber, and this map is well defined. One fiber sends it to a point on the curve. So, I mean, it has on F, of course, but um, but this is well defined, and when you write it to morphism, rho is well defined by lemma one. Now. 
now the universal sheaf F tilde is the push forward push forward of uh, rank equal oh, sorry rank R torsion free sheaf Torsion free sheaf supported on co-dimension on the co-dimension one, co-dimension one closed sub scheme. I will call this thing S tilde, which by definition is the X. You see those two maps? Is X x times the fiber product over c of x times m and it naturally gets mapped to as an inclusion it gets mapped to non-fiber product of x and m just the usual product of x and m right for every point of m this map uh, gives us a sheaf which is um, supported on the fiber of x on that point because this is rho fiber of x over c is the surfaces the fiber of m over c is the sheaf supported on basically eventually on those surfaces so there is this closed sub scheme on which there is a universal sheaf g tilde if you like and your universal sheaf on the moduli space is somehow pushed forward of this sheaf supported on this closed subscheme inside the ambient thick because universal sheaf exists in here. Well, it's, a, it's a torsion universal sheaf. Fiber was supported on surfaces. So it's a push forward of something on this closed subscheme from here, the fiber product, to here, the usual product. Okay, so you have this thing here. S tilde is the pullback. Back of diagonal. Diagonal inside C times C. And hence, we can actually show that Co-normal bundle of S tilde is isomorphic to I upper star of P upper star of rho upper star of canonical of the curve. Rho upper star of the canonical of the curve lives in here. P upper star takes it to here. And then I upper star takes it to the scheme. And this is just a realization of the fact that what happens for the canonical bundle, you see, if you have some sp specific geometry where the canonical of X comes from the base. Now you have some scheme in the level of the module because you are defining some universal scheme whose canonical kind of comes from the base. And this is what it is. This is very important in our analysis. Okay, so we have this condition. Now there is a theorem. I'll call it theorem three. perfect deformation obstruction theory, the per perfect obstruction theory over M in for position two is given by um, given by homorphism in the draft category.
What is it? So A dot is defined by a certain truncation in level 1, 2 of Rp over star of R hump over x cross n of our universal sheets, which now we know what kind of sheets they are. These are universal torsion sheets. Dual, shifted by minus 1, and it gets naturally mapped to truncated cotangent complex of our line vices. Everything like is like before, except that these sheets are really supported on the fibers. Okay? They are not sheets on the fibers. They are sheets supported on the fibers. If they were just sheets on the fiber, then our modulus is just specializes to the modulus piece of such sheaves on the fiber, and that's it. All S modules. It's not that. It's the sheaves which are set theoretically supported on reduced surfaces, given by the irreducible fibers of this vibration, but they can have thickenings outside of the fiber. So their deformation theory tries to detect behavior of the sheath as an OS module on the fiber, how it deforms on the fiber, together with how the fiber moves infinitesimally inside the tree. Okay. And the corresponding Corresponding DT invariants of X with the choice of fixed term character is again defined by because you have this fiber by ser duality, which gives you the self symmetry as I discussed, it is, it is defined by degree of the zero dimensional virtual class of this modulus. Fiber was said, but it tells you that we have self symmetry. And it's still sharp. So, can you explain what you look for the universal sheet? Why, why is such a push forward? Mm -hmm. I will show you one more time what this means. I, I need to show you again. Um, well, I mean, these are torsion sheets. Okay? Think about. Think about um, I mean, the fact, what did we prove? We proved that sheaf is supported on the S. But this is a sheaf of OX modules. So this is purely coming from the, the surface. So it's some push forward of some sheaf on the surface, right? The ambient. And this is just trying to tell you the analog of that in the, in the, in the, the family version of that thing, basically. Just like that. You, you can have, you can define things like you look at the modulized space of sheets on the surface, G. So those are defined over S times M of the surface. S is embedded inside X, and it gets mapped inside X times M. Now, if you pull that back, that the scheme over there, you will get this universal subscheme, basically. Why is it torsion-free? Hmm? It's torsion not torsion-free. It's torsion-free on its support. Yeah, it's not torsion free, but it's torsion free on its support. Yeah. And its rank is, we know what its rank is, rank R on its own support. Yeah. It's actually, it's actually torsion with regards to the ambient X. Okay. So this is that, and now we go to the smooth vibrations. In these, in these, uh, okay. So we now we now assume we now assume that pi x to c is a smooth. Every fiber is smooth and the total of space is smooth. And conditions A, B, C are satisfied.
then the fibers of pi are non-singular projective surfaces, are non-singular projective surfaces with trivial canonical bundles. have a divisor, its canonical bundle can be captured by its normal bundle. Uh, if you have some sub-variety in general, look at the normal bundle of this thing, top wedge product of this thing, tensor to the canonical, gives it the canonical of that thing. These are divisors, so you're looking at the first wedge product. So it's just a normal bundle times the canonical. And the canonical is coming from the base. The normal bundle is supported on the surface, but the canonical of the variety comes from the base. So the tensor product is just four. So these are, they have trivial canonical bundles. And so, if you have that, then um, definition number four, we you would like to look at this moduli space and it has connected components and you would like to give names to them. We call a connected component MC. C stands for connected of M, um, a type 1 component, type 1 component. If rho of that connected component is all of C. Here's a component, and if the rho is all of C, it's a connected component. And, and otherwise, Call it type two. The type two component. A type two component type two component uh, is called isolated. If it is isomorphic, isomorphic to a moduli space, moduli space of torsion free sheaves on a non singular fiber of pi, torsion free sheaves on a non singular. You see, type 2 components could be like point like, could be moduli space of sheaves supported on the fiber. But then, if it is one fiber, what kind of it? What kind of a moduli space is it? Is it like isolated point with some fattening? So is it like thickening the moduli space of sheaves, which could have infinitesimal deformations around that fiber? So as a point realized inside the moduli space, is that component like a fat point or is it like an isolated point of one specific point? So these type two components have isolated and non-isolated types. The isolated type are the ones which are just honest sheets or just honestly supported on that fiber. They don't deform outside. So the moduli space is just moduli space of that fiber. And over that fiber, our torsion sheaves become torsion free because they're torsion free over their support, and these are torsion free sheaves on that fiber. So we have three types of things that can happen. Connected components whose image is just all of C, that's an S. And type two components, and isolated type two components. Okay, 
So we have that, and we denote type 1 components by M0 and isolated type 2 by M iso. Why is it that I'm not giving a name to non-isolated type 2? It will be clear later for you because we will do some analysis that even if our modulus is on one of those things after, I mean, we are calculating the deformation invariance. And eventually the deformation invariance tells us that those guys can be also captured from these. The same way that you can deform a point to a fat neighborhood of it by tensoring it with the ring of dual numbers. It's deformation argument. Okay, so now remark Mukai proves that the moduli space. Modulized space of stable sheaves on a non singular, non singular projective surface with trivial canonical bundle. These are all the conditions that we have here. We have trivial canonical bundle because of the geometry of the three fold. These are non-singular, they are projective because the way we constructed it, surface with trivial canonical bundle is non-singular. This is amazing. So this immediately implies that implies that if M of C is a type one or an isolated Two component of M, then M C is a smooth one of them is literally the modulus of so she's on a, in a non singular projective surface with trivial canonical bonds. One of them is obvious. The other one is the total space of such things on the curve. Everything is smooth, actually. I mean, we're not worried about singularities in this particular problem. Why the total space is smooth? Yeah, so fiber-wise, this is smooth. This is an, an intuitive thing, but fiber-wise, this is smooth, right? You take the total space, the base is smooth, non singular curve. Fiber-wise, this is smooth. So it seems like we are trying to calculate the invariance for a smooth space. This is space, a smooth but obstructed. And with the, with the given obstruction theory, we want to calculate the invariance for a smooth space. Why cap one is smooth? Huh? Why cap one? Yeah, because as I was just saying, total space. Space is smooth. Fiber is smooth, everything. C is a smooth. Everything is smooth. Okay, so we are uh, we are doing this, and we know uh, we know. So how much time? Yes, we know that uh, for any fiber S. I and any coherent sheaf G 
So for the non S, X three S G G is equal to zero. This essentially wait, wait, wait. what is this? Um, I, do I want to say this? <laughs> this a little bit is on. Well, maybe it's possible. It's okay. This essentially implies that a type 1 component of component M0 of M admit, admits a row relative definition of structure theory. Let me show you what, what I'm trying to say. So this is theorem six. There is a row relative. Remember, row was this map M goes to C. What does the row relative obstruction theory tell you? It is telling you about Deformations and obstructions of the sheaves supported on those fibers. And what are those things? Those are G's. Those are G's. That's what, why row relative matters. So there is a row relative um, deformation obstruction theory. Obstruction theory on an uh, over a Type one component and zero given by the following description. Some truncation again, R pi pi p over a star of I star R hom X times okay, so X is this is fiber product over the curve again of G and G. Shifted by minus one, and it has a map to truncated cotangent complex of the relative moduli space. Truncated cotangent complex of the moduli space relative to the curves. Relative cotangent complex of the map rule, particular. Okay, so this is what I meant. If I if I look at extensions of G, and I say that's equal to zero, the way I, I want to think about is that, as you can see, you see, this thing is essentially some moduli space of S times M, surface times M. This is fiber product of X times M. These are objects supported on that universal subscheme S, S tilde. So R hom makes sense over there, but that universal subscheme is embedded inside the product of X times M. So I need to push it forward. Then when I'm living over x times m, I can push down all the way to m. I push down to m, of course, but then to get a map, I get a map to this thing. And you would say, what does this space even mean? I mean, this contagion complex is always also is, a, is some object of derived category of m. It comes from the cone of two complexes inside m. So this is not a space. This doesn't have any meaning. This is just a cone of two cotangent complexes as objects in the drive category of M. And this thing gets mapped to it. That's, that's the story. So everything in here lives on M, drive category of M. So. So what is happening in here? So. 
Now for position, this proposition clarifies my comment over there. For position um, seven, the row relative obstruction theory in theorem six uh, over a type one component and zero induces a perfect absolute obstruction theory f dot zero which gets mapped to cotangent complex of m zero on m zero. So okay. Let me draw this diagram, and then you will see what I mean. You have this map rho from a type 1 component of M to C. Then what you can do, you can look at the canonical exact triangle of cotangent complexes. C is a non-singular curve. Cotangent complex is the same as cotangent sheaf, and actually it is dimension one, it's just a canonical. So rho upper star of cotangent of that goes to L dot of M0. Cone between those two is just a definition of what I wrote there. That's what I was trying to say. This is not a space. This cotangent complex lives in the drive category of M. It's just a cone of two things, and that's what the cone is. And now, this guy, this whole thing, I can call it G dot. This thing, okay, so I can push this all also forward. Not go forward, I mean, I can continue the triangle. And I need to shift by one. That thing lives in here. It captures deformations and obstruction to deformations of fiber-wise moduli spaces over the points of curve. And, well, it gets naturally mapped in here because since it gets mapped in here and it gets mapped in here, I can compose. So if I can just put this thing again in here. There is no problem in doing that. And naturally, I get this morphism. So I can call this map G. Take the cone of this map G in the draft category and put it in here. And I can discuss, is there a map from here to here? And if there is a map from here to here, then I can use cohomology. I want to see if this thing is an obstruction theory or not. It needs to induce isomorphism in these levels, and it needs to induce surjections in the H minus 1 level. To do that, I, I take the long, I look at long exact cohomology of the two rows and use five lemma to show what happens in A0 level and what happens in H1. It's not usual stuff, right? And this gives us the absolute obstruction theory F dot zero. So looking at long exact, long exact sequence of cohomologies. We can prove that f dot zero, which by definition is the cone of this map G shifted by minus one, is an absolute obstruction theory. Why is it that we do this thing after all? You see, your sheets are inside the threefold. But really, honestly, they are on the surface. But I would like to study them inside the threefold. So I need to first look at the deformation obstruction theory of those things fiber-wise, and somehow push them forward on the threefold. So what did I do to do that? I constructed fiber-wise obstruction theory. Out of that, I constructed an absolute theory. Now, this absolute theory is the theory of push forward of these things on inside the threefold. So realization of these torsion-free sheets as torsion modules inside the three-fold, that's what it captures. 
this thing. Okay. So so what is the story then? Now with this, now we have so far we have two absolute obstruction series. One of them is f dot zero, which is somewhat given by absolutifying a relative obstruction theory of g dots. And the other one I called the e dot earlier. The, 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 the one constructed by Richard Thomas. Okay. And we need to compare them. And we want to compare them. And this is the most fun part of this story. Compare them. Okay. First, an observation. Imagine that you have some surface. One of these fibers naturally gets embedded inside the trefoil, like that. And imagine that you have one of these torsion-free sheaves, G, on S as an OS module. And we know that our sheaf F inside the trefoil, by the lemma that we just proved, is isomorphic to push forward of this sheaf G. Can you relate deformations of F inside the trefoil and deformations of G as an OS module? That's this story. If you want to relate them, you need to look at them both inside the trefoil. That, that's why we're looking at both of them inside the trefoil. And so, how do you see this point-wise, at least, in this very simple picture? Well, very simple fact. You can push forward G, and then pull it back. Pulling it back has to do with tensoring with the structure sheet on the surface, but because the surface is a divisor, it's not a line bundle, it's not a left exact thing, right? So you can look at the exact sequence of the surface, tensor it, you will have higher torques. So here in this context, left right pullback is the only thing that makes sense. It's not the, it's not the usual pullback. It's left right pullback, and now it pull. Because you have higher cohomologies and higher tours. So what do you get? You get back your shift G. But you also get something else, which is G twisted by minus S shifted by 1. And this kind of understands the way your G supported on S was realized inside the surface. So you get back sheaf G tensor with its co-normal bundle of S inside S. That's what it is. If you didn't understand this statement, I will now show you and you will understand it better. Now let's apply Hong G to this thing. R Hong. R G to this exact triangle. Let's see what happens. You will get some R hum G G. This is in the direct category of S, because these two are both modules on S. Then you will get R hum pull back of the push forward of G and G again inside the of S. And you will get R hum G minus S G. Well, shift would be one in here, but this is a covariant coordinate, so uh, five. So it will become minus one when it comes out. What I can do is I can now use the left adjointness of drive pullback and drive push forward, but because this is an inclusion map, drive push forward is the same as the push forward. So what happens is that this R hum is realized that I lower star of some R hum that lives on the ambient space. Well, I don't need to put it anymore actually here. The X 
of I over a star of G, and this thing moves over, I over a star of G. And this is as it is, and this is, well, this is important, right? To make sense of what's happening in here, now that I use this duality between the two, everything is supposed to live in the drive category of X. So really what's happening is that I, R, I lower star of R hum G G is not some object in the drive category of X, gets mapped to here, and then I lower star of this guy, R hum that. And now you use the fact that by definition, this is your f, the torsion module. So this is exactly equal to r hum to the d of x of f comma f. And r hum of g of g, by push lower, I, I lower a star, and then I lower a star r hum g. Let's move this over here. G has shifted by S positively, shifted by minus 1. Twisted by S positively, shifted by minus 1. What I said you will now understand better is the fact that what kind of information does this carry? This is basically telling you that it's like superposition in classical mechanics. If you have some object in threefold and it's deforming, its deformation is a superposition of its deformations of what it does on the surface, together with contributions that come from movement of the surface inside the threefold. The movement of the surface inside the threefold is realized by normal bundle of the surface. That's O S of S. And this is why. So this is the normal bundle, but this is the co-normal bundle in here. And that's what I said. Here now you can understand. So now you can completely understand what's going on. I mean, you have some sheaf which is pushed forward with something inside here. Obstructions to this deformation, to this deformation of F, are related to obstructions of G and plus extra contributions. So this is like a hybrid moduli space, which really is the moduli space of things on the surface together with movements of surface inside the tree pole. And this gives us a relation eventually, induces relation. I'm not going to write it because this is the end of the lecture at this point today. Induces relations between f dot and f dot zero and e dot, which also induces relations between some corresponding virtual classes. Virtual class of m respect to one obstruction theory versus virtual class of m respect to the other obstruction theory. And this somehow gives us a three, eventually it helps us to calculate integrations over virtual class of the threefold object moduli space with respect to integrals over the surface plus top term class of things that capture extra contributions. So that's where I'm going. Integral over m d dot is going to be integral 1 because this is virtual dimension 0. Integral 1 over m e dot is going to be integral over some something else, f dot zero, together with top churn class of the obstruction bundle that I get over here, the extra contributions. The, the, the two are going to be in the uh, same. I will do it next time. So thank you. So where does the modularity come from? You will get there, because now, when you go over the surface mod modulized space, eventually, eventually you will just go completely, you can realize this integration completely as surface mod moduli space, plus contributions that come from these movements. These movements, eventually, imagine that your sheaves are ideal sheaves of curves, for example, let's say, on the surface. These movements tell you about how does a curve deform inside the street ball. So it deforms on the surface itself, that's a certain different scheme, whose generating series of modular form. And then it also has to do with movement of the curve inside the threefold as long as it remains as a 1-1 one, one class. So infinitesimal deformations of the surface, of course, does not necessarily keep the surface as a 1-1 one, one class. And those are the nodal lattice numbers who also have modular forms as their generating series. So we will discuss it next time. Thank you. And let me just...
segundo. Bom, é assim. Ah, tá.